Kia ora. my name's Elise. I'm an artist living in Whangarei, Aotearoa, but I'm originally from Seattle. I specialize in immersive art, meaning art that surrounds you, that you can become a part of. I like to make confusing and surprising things that encourage people to look at our world differently than before. One of my challenges in this work is creating the experience of an imagined world while only being able to use materials from this planet in this universe. I'm here to talk you through a bit of it, using my current project as a baseline example. I'd like to share with you some of my design considerations for my current project. It's titled Deep Phosphine. In case you don't know, phosphines are the lights you see behind your eyelids when the nerves in your eyes are stimulated by pressure rather than exposure to light, like when you rub your eyes and see fireworks or swirling patterns. Deep Phosphine is an immersive, interactive installation. I'm developing it in Whangarei over the next few months with the support of the AFI Incubator Project and Creative New Zealand. It'll be a walk-in diorama built into a portable shipping container. The set will depict a snapshot of what life is like for an alien species I made up. The diorama will represent a research station and hab unit for some aliens visiting Earth as a capsule structure they brought with them as if they made it on their home planet and left it behind. Everything inside needs to appear to be made on another planet. This is a photo of a past project. It's a guerrilla art piece where I created an interactive glowworm cave inside an abandoned steel tank. Using tiny cutouts of glow-in-the-dark acrylic glued to magnets, I set up constellations on the ceiling. Anyone who dares to go inside can move around the glowy bits and arrange them as they please. I intend deep phosphine to have a similar feel on entering the space, a feeling like you've just stepped into something unknown and you're not sure what to expect. For otherness to be believable, it needs to be built out of otherworldly materials. Since I only have access to materials from my own world, I'm digging around looking for the more rare elements which are less familiar to most people. Things with organic and non-organic elements combined are less common in our world. So I'm trying to create a bunch of that kind of feeling. Most things here on Earth either look straight-edged and built by people or irregular and grown by plants and animals. So I'm designing set components to appear as semi-organic structures mixed up with regular geometry. For example, this is how I make my crystal fungi out of moldable plastic and colorful acrylic mirror. They've got a strange mix of shiny color and semi-translucent springy framework. This wiggly starfish-like object has skeletal elements, as well as window-like features. Things that glow in the dark are also pretty rare in our natural world, at least on dry land, so incorporating bioluminescence is always fun. These are webs I created out of luminous paracord. It's a great material for weaving otherworldly artifacts with soft fabric components. There's a lot of biodiversity on my imagined planet. This is a guide of structures which are recognizable to us as plants, but with some mysterious characteristics. It's supposed to be an explanation written by them for us to explain some of the plants they live with. The way it's labeled shows how they interact with the plants and how they group them for different uses. Does Earth have any venomous plants? Related to the different plant biology, I also need to consider the different ways my species might take in nutrients. Maybe they don't eat like we do. Maybe they don't even poop. When I'm designing their bodies, I need to consider how they breathe, how they get energy to run their bodies, if and how they sleep, how they communicate, and how they reproduce. This has taken me down some really interesting Wikipedia rabbit holes. I've been learning about some of the more rare body characteristics in our world, like how the mantis shrimp can see the polarity of light and how pit vipers can see heat. I've even been digging into atomic chemistry and researching potentially habitable exoplanets. Related to their own unique biology, my invented species has developed a different number system and even a different way to group elements. Based on the number of biological digits in their bodies, what we might interpret as fingers, they count in base 6 or base 36 depending on the form of communication. Based on this, all their geometry defaults to a hexagonal standard. Where we view the square as our main building block, sometimes fractured into rectangles or right triangles, they use hexagons, trapezoids, and equilateral triangles. 
When I'm designing furniture or equipment props for this project, I have to try to rearrange my thinking as well. So the things in the project that we can touch and hold are in line with the fundamental scientific and engineering standards I've made up. I have to remember to think hexagonally, building how they would build, thinking about what they take for granted as ordinary. This different biological experience of the world also affects word development and grouping. As people, we usually create words for things based on the base units of a material, object, or concept, like what it's made out of or what it's about. This alien species might build words based on how the thing or idea interacts with other things and ideas, like how an object or idea combines with other things or changes other things. They'll have different kinds of synonyms, different sets of opposites, different words will sound similar to each other. Different word structures lead to different methods of storytelling, history, writing, and even imagining. So any written texts I make up need to reflect word structures and concept structures, as well as the physical form of the written language. There are some other things I need to consider related to biology, like reproduction, family structure, social hierarchies, and general social values. I'm designing a species which takes in nutrients without taking the lives of others. And this biological ability is reflected in their social structure. It's also reflected in their cooperative process for creating new life and how they care for their next generation together as a group until maturity and independence. As humans, to take in enough nutrients to survive, we generally have to take a lot of something away from a plant or animal, which usually involves some sort of incarceration, maiming, or killing of the food species. We take this for granted as necessary and I see a correlation between this philosophy and our global history of colonialism and wars over territory. What if we were biologically able to eat without damaging another species? How might this affect our consumer culture? Could we possibly take for granted that cooperation between all of us is more efficient and mutually beneficial? Once I've established how the reproduction cycle works, now I need to consider generation time spans and what that means for population balance and what roles the individuals take on throughout their lives. This affects what kind of crew would have been living and working in this research capsule. Are there babies present here? How about newly matured adults? How about experienced elders? Depending on who makes up the crew, you'd expect to find different types of work and play activities in the capsule. Since I've decided this is a family operation, there will be fun and educational activities for multiple maturity levels here. There will be games to play, learning materials, science projects, and a very unexpected tea cabinet. Including this range of interactive stimuli gives me a variety of platforms to show visiting humans what it's like to live as this species. We'll get to play with their toys, read their books, explore their experiments. We'll learn about them by feeling what it's like to live in their space. The plan is to create a fun intersection of tactile immersion and imagination. This is a sample from the instructions for a game I made up to include in my installation, which visiting humans can actually play. Now that we know this species likes science and games, it's not a stretch to imagine they're the type of beings that are interested in meeting and learning about other species. So what's a unique way they could do that, which would not be based on earth science and would be uniquely their own discovery? Their evolution as a very communal species has given them a form of near telepathy. With a lot of research and many generations of scientists working on it, they've developed a way to extend that natural ability. They can now connect with individuals from other species, if the other species is sentient enough to pick up on the intent to communicate. The premise of my installation is that the aliens intentionally left the research capsule on Earth as a curiosity and intellectual test for humans. They want to know if we're evolutionarily ready to interact with them. Are the humans interested in learning about this? Are we smart enough to find the hidden clues left by the aliens? As visitors to this capsule, we may wonder, how can we try it? Is it possibly real? Is there a hope that maybe this concept isn't entirely made up? Overall, my general approach to designing an alternative reality is to try to think big and small at the same time. Details are important, the big picture is important, but most important of all is consistency. Am I creating details using the same framework as the big picture? Does the big picture make sense in the context of the details? 
It's an iterative process, and I often end up doing a lot of backtracking and re-envisioning as I become aware of how my earth biases have influenced my design components. I'm finding that as I have to ask myself new questions about the alternative reality I'm making up, I'm at the same time finding myself trying to answer a lot of unexpected questions about my own world and my own personal experiences here. If you'd like to see Deep Phosphine in person or virtually, you can follow the project online to keep up to date with progress and opening dates and locations. Thank you.